want to say three things and then make you an offer, really. The first is, is this. I just want to tell you what our financial strategy is to supporting growth within our country. Uh, as you know, we, as you may know, we've just put together under the Corbyn administration a new architecture in terms of economic advice and the development of economic policy. And that has brought together an economic advisory council, which includes some of the world's leading economists, Joseph Stiglitz, Kaketi, and Mariana Mazzucato, a whole range of others, and they meet on a regular basis now to provide us with macroeconomic advice. And alongside them, we have a whole range of different other experts doing reviews of the, the Treasury, um, Danny Blanchard doing a review of Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, Prem Seeker and his whole team of tax justice accountants doing a review of HMRC and taxation policy. And they're advising us on the development of a whole range of economic policies for the long-term future. And one of the key issues for us is to try and ensure that we give security to developers, investors and others for the long term. So we've developed our own fiscal credibility rule uh, advised by the Economic Advisory Council and it includes this and this is why it's important to many of yourselves. First of all, it's, a, it's based upon paying down the deficit of a rolling programme of five years. Secondly, it's reducing debt within the lifetime of Parliament. Thirdly, if the monetary policy is rendered ineffective on the basis of advice from the Monetary Policy Committee, it means also that we can have a knockout clause which develops fiscal stimulus. But I think the importance for yourselves is we've extracted long-term investment from that rule. Unlike George Osborne's rule, which includes a constraint upon investment, we've excluded it because we believe there needs to be a long-term investment strategy for this country. And Virtually every body I go and talk to, whether it's the CBI, the Chamber of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, Trade Unions, the TUC, they all seem to be on the same page about the nature of that investment. And it's about investment in skills. Well, that's day-to-day -day current expenditure, so that's within the rules. But we think we can afford it on the basis of if we grow the economy. But infrastructure investment is excluded. So in infrastructure investment is key for us. And by that, we mean both the road, the rail, the energy sector, but key for that infrastructure investment is housing. On a scale, I think, that we need to invest, not seen since the 1960s. But a sector of that infrastructure investment that everyone focuses on, two aspects are both in terms of new technology, but also sustainability with the threat of climate change. So our fiscal rule will provide us with that opportunity of what Mariana Mazzucato calls the long-term patient investment that we need within our infrastructure. And in particular, as I say, housing. The second issue is just to address that particular issue of the housing crisis. I represent um, a constituency where I've lived for the last 40 years, west of London, uh, north of Heathrow, includes Heathrow. It's a working class, multicultural community. Last night, there would have been well, sometimes on average it's 200, but last night I think it dipped a bit. But there was a large number of families in bed and breakfast in my constituency classified as homeless. I will also have people sleeping along the canal, in the parks, in tents, under hedges, and in shop doorways. I'll also have people renting, renting garages and sheds for their families. I also have a developing shanty town in parts of my constituency. We've not seen this scale of homelessness and housing crisis in my constituency, but I think London and South East, in maybe two or three generations. And to be frank, in the fifth richest country of the world, it's morally indefensible. And it's as a result of the lack of housing investment over, yes, a generation at least, at least over 30 years. Uh, failure to build council properties, the selling off of council properties and the failure to replace them. And here's the irony. I have a conservative council which has sold off lots of its properties like many others and I try to work with them as effectively as I can. They're now renting back the very properties that they sold off 20 years ago to put homeless families in those properties at relatively high rents. And that's the other thing. The rents in my area now are between 12 and 1,600 pounds a month. So people are in work but they're working all the hours God send to keep a roof over their heads. And we've reinvented the back-to-back. -back. 
we've reinvented the back-to-back. -back. Fronts of properties being rented to one family and the back of a property being rented to another. And it's all because of the failure of housing supply. The third issue is actually, in terms of developmental land in my area, land is becoming available. We've had major sites become available. But the contrast is this, and this is why um, I was pleased to be invited uh, by Martin Evans and you and I think, because I've worked with the Cathedral Group in advance of their merger into you and I think over the last decade or so. For 30 years, I've been campaigning in my constituency to have the old EMI site, the records factory where the Beatles records were made, to prevent it becoming a derelict site and to becoming one in which it not just provides housing, but employment and opportunities, leisure opportunities and research opportunities. And actually working with the cathedral group and a local authority that's not of my political complexion, but nevertheless of constructively engaged. If you come down to Hayes now, you'll see development of a site which I think is spectacular. New homes, new jobs and a balance between the homes and the jobs new leisure facilities, and in the tradition of the EMI site, what I find is wonderful, a broadcasting college, which will teach youngsters coming up in the broadcasting media and give them the skills and opportunities in a modern world to obtain the high-wage, high-skilled jobs that they aspire to. I contrast that with another site in my constituency that became available and developed about five years ago which has become tower blocks alongside the canal, where the social housing is put in one corner and not integrated in the rest of the site. Where, I just quote one tenant, apartheid exists, where social tenants cannot path, go the, use the pathways of the privately owned residents. And where the, well, the promises of the original negotiations on the 106 for social values and arts centre some other facilities on site have not been materialised, have not been brought about. And again, I just contrast the two, the constructive engagement, a company coming along, listening to the local people, learning the history of the site, developing local community ideas, what's on site, and then putting that together in a viable economic framework, which was actually delivering for my community. Whereas another, to be frank, has become a, a development for speculators and others with little social gain. And I just contrast the two. And what was the difference? I think the difference was this, and that's the other point I'd like to make. The difference is this, is because you had either... A, the, I've been in local government, I was a chief of the Association of London Government, and before that I was the head of policy at Camden Council, and before that I was Ken Livingstone's deputy and the chair of finance on the GLC, the Charles the Exchequer for London, if you wish. Now, my experience is that often you'll find there's a creative developer that can bring along a local authority and actually engage and ensure that there's a direction and successful development. Or you can have a local authority that again can be creative and successful, bring along a developer, and actually you can then harness the resources of one or the other to bring the others to a suitable conclusion and successful. Or you can have both creative developers working with creative entrepreneurial local council, and again in that way ease the path towards a creative development. And I think that's the future. The future is what <clears throat> we're seeing in terms of our economic discussion of policy at the moment within the Labour Party. We're looking to develop the ideas of Mariana Mazzucato in terms of the entrepreneurial state, where the state at every level in central government, regional and local government works with the local private sector in creating both products and markets and development sites, etc., that meets the needs of both the local communities the regional or national economy, and at the same time, the developer and the investors themselves. And that's the discussion that we're now having in the development of our policies. Nowhere more is it needed, as far as I can see, is in the housing market itself, because the housing crisis that we face at the moment. And it's a crisis of not just of the failure to build council homes or housing associations and just selling them off as well. It's also a crisis of home ownership. That's why we've put into government now, specifically, sorry, into Shadow Cabinet now, a, a Shadow Secretary of State, John Healy, specifically with the responsibility for housing. And he's developing a programme. He's launched a review under Pete Redfern for Taylor Woodrow to report this summer on the issues of home ownership and why it's declined. 
He's also looking and working with local authorities, the local government association, labor group, on opportunities at how we become at the local government level now, that entrepreneurial state, working with private developers and architects, etc., to look at sites, how they can be created to develop, not just to deliver housing, but also to deliver the jobs that we need for those people that will go into that accommodation. So yes, major mixed-use developments, but to do it creatively as well. And that's the other factor that's come on board as well. The insistence upon sustainability in all that we do in terms of the housing developments and also the employment opportunities. And our argument is that every job should be a green job. Every job that we create from here on in should take responsibility for tackling climate change. Every building that we put up should be sustainable in the long term. But in addition to that, I just, I come from, I'm a socialist, I come from that socialist tradition that includes William Morris. Aesthetics are important as well. It's important that people enjoy the environment that they're living and working in. And that adds to their creativity at the same time, stimulating the wider community as well. So that's the approach we're taking in terms of government policy. It's about long-term, stable economic policy making that gives us long-term, patient investment in infrastructure and skills, the new technology, but recognising that actually housing is going to be one of the key elements in that long-term investment project plan. Secondly, that we look for an entrepreneurial state at every level. Creativity from local government and national government working together with the private sector. And then thirdly, making sure that actually it's long-term objectives, which is ensuring we invest in infrastructure that looks at new technology, that also looks at sustainability, and yes, tries to make life that just a bit more, and you won't hear these words from a politician very often, beautiful and enjoyable. So that's the direction of policy that we're undertaking. There are real challenges of how we raise those resources. So in the review of the tax base, I don't want to frighten you, but we're looking at a whole range of opportunities that we'll consult you on as well. I'm interested in land valuation tax, land value tax. Usually we have to lock the door at this point in time if there are developers present. But I actually think there's ideas like that that we need to look at seriously. But we wouldn't move in that direction unless we were, unless we were able to take people with us. I am also in, <laughs> I'm also interested in how we can look at local government again. My fears for local government at the moment in terms of funding, and this is a, this is a cross-party point in many respects because I've spoken to council leaders of all political persuasion is that they are given more and more responsibilities as the grant is withdrawn, and they're now, in a number of years' time, supposed to be dependent solely on business rates, whilst at the same time, and I support it in the, bu the budget, large numbers of small businesses are being exempted from business rates. So we have a strategy from central government at the moment that actually is loading more responsibilities onto local government, whilst at the same time withdrawing the resources that they need to actually fulfil those responsibilities. And again, we need a serious discussion about the funding of local government for the future and the tax base that local government will have in the future as well and their abilities to be creative in terms of how they themselves borrow and generate income to ensure long-term patient stable investment within their local communities. Finally, let me say this because I want to open it up to questions. Um, this is the challenge really. In every area of policy now, we're at that, we've been, the Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn was elected six months ago. Um, ten months ago, I was looking forward to a slow drift into retirement and sitting at the back of halls of Labour Party conferences moaning that they never followed my advice, that's why we're in the mess we are. So uh, it's about as shocking to me being called the shadow chance as it is to you, I would have thought. But what we're trying to do now, having been in position six months, is ensure that our development, this first base of development of policy, is based upon a thorough engagement with all sectors within our community. So let me put this challenge to you. In every area of policy now, we've got working groups. What we haven't got a working group on at the moment is this whole concept of site development, community development in terms of housing, infrastructure, etc. If any of you are interested in participating in a group of that sort, let me know. Let me know via Martin because I'll convene that discussion to see how we go forward. We're desperate for ideas. We're desperate for harnessing the creativity of our population, of our communities. 
And in that way, we feel we can prepare for government, almost a renaissance in terms of political ideas as we go into government, and just get some excitement again in the politics of this country that goes beyond just rows about whether we're in or out or who said what to whom and who's plotting the downfall of whom. I think there's an opportunity here. And as we're in opposition, we've got four years in the development of these policies, there's an opportunity for the Labour Party to start listening again and engaging in a more thorough way than we've ever done before. Thanks a lot.